Hey folks, more than a game producer Zach Ziegler here. Tony's off this week. I'm not sure why. Maybe the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament so completely decimated his bracket that he's in mourning. Maybe he's actually the Tony Perkins who plays for the University of Iowa. Perkins takes it himself on the dive and the foul. And he's home recovering from his NIT tournament loss. I get the feeling it has more to do with the fact that it's spring break for many schools in the Tucson area, though. Either way, rather than take a week off, we're bringing you this kind of a bonus episode, kind of a full episode, with an interview that sits at a pretty unusual intersection. We've all heard of athletes dabbling in the music industry, or maybe even going a bit farther, from the less than memorable, or maybe too memorable, Chicago Bears Super Bowl shuffle. We are the Bears, shuffling crew, shuffling on down. To Arizona Wildcat Harvey Mason Jr.'s post-basketball days working on music projects with artists ranging from Stevie Wonder to the soundtracks of movies like Sing and Pitch Perfect. How about the intersection of football and opera, though? AZPM Classical Radio Music Coordinator and Afternoon Host Andy Bate recently spoke with Morris Robinson, a bass who won a Grammy in 2022 for his performance on a recording of Mahler's Symphony No. 8. But years before becoming a professional opera singer, he was an All-American football player at the Citadel. We hear about both of those careers and how he came back to singing after years of success in a corporate job. Andy takes it from here. Your story is pretty well known, but there are always listeners who just are not familiar with it. So would you give us just a synopsis of how you got here? (laughs) I'll give you the short version. But I I went to a high school performing arts in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I was in the marching band. I got to the first game of the marching band and decided... I don't want to be in the marching band because all the cool kids are on the football field. So I went back to the uh, head of the school and said, if I join the chorus full time, can I quit the band and play football? So I became a singer so I could play football, actually. That's, that's the, the root of the story. Uh, my high school was pretty advanced. We did the Mozart Requiem my junior year. We did the Haydn's Creation my senior year. I got all the bass solos for that. And uh, when it became time to go to college, I decided to take a football scholarship instead of a music scholarship. So I ended up at the Citadel which is not known at all for his musical program because there is not one. But I was the director of the gospel choir. I was also one of the captains of the football team. I made All-American. Had a really good time there playing football and getting some discipline, you know, things you need there. Uh, graduated and went in corporate America. And uh, at the age of 30, decided to go back into uh, giving this thing called vocalism a shot. And uh, I auditioned for a weekend program at the New England Conservatory of Music. And uh, they heard me sing the national anthem and asked me to join their opera studio. I joined their opera studio, and I was doing a production of Michael Balfe's Satanella, it's an operetta, and the head of Boston University Music Opera Institute uh, heard me and asked me if I'd consider auditioning for our program. That's kind of how it all started. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, First... You know, I, I know growing up, um, I was in the band as well. I, I didn't sing until I was in college. Um, so that was a big change for me at that point. Um, ended up doing choral conducting. But um, there's often a, a, a dichotomy between the arts and sports. And um, it's a, a choice that often kids are forced into from a very early age. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever had any thoughts about how we could make them not so competitive <laughs> against each other, but maybe working uh, in complement to one another a little better. You know, I think as the maturation pr- process continued, um, the dichotomy between the two kind of melded. Uh, there grew an appreciation from the guys I was in the locker room with with the theme that I can do that was kind of odd in a bar trick at one point. They were fascinated by it. But going up to, until that point, it certainly was a dichotomy. It was certainly some uh, a war between the two. And I represented each you know, each side. I think in retrospect, at the ripe old age that I am now, that I probably excelled in sports really well because I wanted to justify my musical capabilities. Um, and that's just me being philosophical you know, later in the game and looking back upon my life. Um, I love 
sports. I love what it did for me. And I do think that the two aren't very far apart. And if you just take a time and, and analyze the two, when your body is your instrument, it takes a certain amount of discipline to pull this off. You have to keep up your voice. You have to keep up your body. When you're working out, you're coaching. You know, you're taking voice lessons. You know, you, you have the ability when a conductor makes a suggestion to make implementation of that suggestion immediately. Or when a coach says the blocking scheme changes, he went from a three, three to a four eye technique. You still got to change. You got to change the blocking scheme because we got to block this differently. So the ability to adapt on the fly, these things are not very far apart from one another. And, uh, you know, as little boys, you know, the tough guys are the athletes. The uh, not so tough guys are the singers. And you can you have to pick a side early on. And I chose to kind of walk down the middle and uh, and be equally good at both. And I think, like I said, in retrospect, it allowed me the freedom to be good at music because I was able to be tough with those guys too. So I don't know how you bridge that gap though, other than pointing out the similarities and generating mutual respect, which I've found has come, like I said, with the maturation process. So, Yeah. Well, I think that the word there, the mutual respect, that's probably the key. Well, if you look at the NBA, for instance, look at Shaquille O'Neal, look at Kobe Bryant, look at Allen Iverson. Those guys all made rap albums as soon as they became millionaires as athletes, you know. And uh, and if you look at these celebrity basketball games, every R&B singer, rap, rapper, hip hop artist, rock and roll artist, country artist, they all want to go to the basketball court and play basketball with these guys. So the mutual respect is there. Uh, I don't know if it's if it is based in adulation uh, from the fans or if it's based in just respect for someone that can do something something that I don't do very well, but always wanted to do. So if, if people look at it from that perspective, I think that they, they aren't very far apart. You made another decision, though, as an adult that had nothing to do with either. Uh, maybe it was just you needed to eat, <laughs> you know, but yeah, you know, you got a job that wasn't in music or in sports and did that for a while. And then it was another major transition to, to leave that when you had family responsibilities. Those are big decisions. Well, there's a certain amount of security that comes with that decision early on. You know, going to a school like the Citadel, uh, you're surrounded by people with like-minded uh, goals. And the goals are to be successful and be financially secure and to obtain the type of occupation that can provide you and your family with all the things that they need. And I was well on that path. That was kind of the, the blueprint that was laid out before me. Uh, no one comes from there and wants to major, have a major musical career. You go there, you want to get in corporate America or you go into the military as an officer and you kind of establish your life there. You plan the next 20 years, you're going to work really hard, put up a nest egg, retire. You know, that was kind of the, the blueprint. And I was following that. I came right out, walked I walked into a job with 3M. I did that job for about five or six years, and I left and went to a division of Exxon in Monsanto selling thermoplastic elastomers. I was regional sales manager. I had a company car, an expense account, you know, um, corporate American Express, you know, the whole thing. I had a house. I was in my second house by the time I quit singing. But, you know, it, it also, there was a point in my life, especially with the second job, where I, I knew after singing at weddings, countless weddings and singing the, the national anthem at events, I knew that I felt like God put me on earth to do something other than to sell Santa Prine <laughs> to Bic and uh, and to Colgate for their toothbrush handles. You know, I, I was not put on this earth to just sell raw materials and make somebody else rich. And um, I wanted to find out why. And that's where this all came from. So that still had to be a big step, and I, I sometimes wonder, maybe I should be interviewing your wife, uh, <laughs> because she must be a remarkable person to, to stand by you and support you when you had all that going for you. And then, even at best, opera is a risk, because there are no guarantees. I mean, you might be good, but yeah. you you got to be better than good yeah. if you're going to make a living at it. And then and you got to be lucky and chosen, too. So. Exactly. <laughs> um, she didn't just stand by my side. She kicked me out the house. It was her, you know, because of my background, security was always very important to me. And uh, I didn't have a kid at the time, which probably made it a lot easier, but... Um, my background was solidity, security, play it safe, get to the end and win. You know, her background was, you should go for it. Why not? We don't have anything else going on. You know, try it out. I'm here. You know, so it was, she was always the one that kept saying, go for it. You know, and then I talked to my other friends that were in corporate America, walking the same path as I was walk walking. And they were very encouraging, too. Like, you can always come back and do this. You know, we're, we're stuck here. <laughs> go try something else. So... Me being a Citadel graduate and having this regimented mindset, I had, um, I put forth goals. 
I'm going to give myself two years to not worry about the financial security, to not worry about the 401k, to not worry about, you know, building my nest egg. Two years to just try this thing out. If it doesn't work in two years, I have a hundred friends that I played ball with, that I graduated with, that will give me another job. I can pop back in there into, you know, middle management and become a VP after five or six years. And, you know, at least I tried, you know, but I never looked back. I gave myself two years and within probably two months, I was already singing the King of Aida at Boston Lyric Opera. So uh, that isn't a testament to how great I am. I think it's more of a testament to God lighting a path for you. You taking a step and he's saying, see, I told you, just stay with this. So, and even times now, you know, I've been all over the world and sung everywhere. You know, there still is no security in this job. There still is no guarantee. There still are no guarantees. But um, you don't you don't get to this point and get left, you know, by the world and by by the person, God, that brought you here. So, you know, there's always some solace in knowing that that in the back of my mind is is something I, I can always count on. And the next opportunity will present itself. So, yeah. Speaking of the music industry and opera in particular, um We've come a long way from the racist tropes of roles like Monasatos in uh, Mozart's The Magic Flute, but classical music performers, composers of color are still the exception, not the rule. From your perspective, where are we now and what needs to happen for the industry to continue to make progress? You know, um, I think we're better than we were 10, 15, even five, three years ago, um, a lot more attention has been focused on diversity and inclusion, even though state laws and sometimes even national laws, I think, are creeping in to eradicate that. Uh, In the arts, I think that, you know, we have to look at how much we've missed out on over the past century or so when we have, you know, ostracized certain people from the business, you know. Black folks are artistic, you know, we're creative, we're musical, you know, we're, we've been that. But we've also been shut out of certain genres, so we weren't able to display that talent. You know, we are now, and we're here, and uh, a lot of focus has been on telling black stories and having black composers and black librettists and black directors and black conductors to implement that aspect of it. I fear that we're going to create separate but equal repertoire, which I don't want to do. I just like to expand the repertoire. You know, I've been very fortunate that, ironically as it may be, I don't get asked to sing uh, Black Rose often. (laughs) I get asked to sing German and Italian repertoire, which is fine. That's what my voice is very well suited for, and that's what I worked hard for. Um, But I'm just happy that the conversation is happening, the awareness is there, and companies are, are making an effort to ameliorate a problem that has been in existence since the conception of this art form. Um, Two of the companies that I represent, Atlanta Opera has a 96-hour opera project where we are out in the community soliciting composers and creators to put together uh, very rapidly in order to address the pipeline issue, a a small operetta that will get a grant that will get a debut. Uh, Cincinnati Opera, we just got the big milling grant, you know, and uh, a lot of money (laughs) to put on three operas. Operas, uh, black composers, black librettists, black stories told in a positive manner, um, and we're excited about that. Uh, the first of which will be debuting in 2025. So lots of work, lots of attention. I've been very much a part of that, um, just pushing the issue and and making it known that this is an important aspect of our business that has been ignored and we need to nurture it and feed it. So I think we're in a better position. I'm, you know, I've been around for a long time. So if there's anything I can leave behind in this business, it would be I would like to leave behind the legacy that this guy stood up, you know, and sometimes spoke in manners that may not have worked to help me personally in this career, but to help people that come after me. Um, Because I've rubbed feathers the wrong way, too. But, you know, I think that the most important things need to be done and to whom much is given, much is required. So I don't mind standing up and being the voice that does these things. So you're in Tucson to sing Verdi's Requiem. That's a great piece. What to you makes this Requiem unique? You know, and this is, uh, I won't say it's a colloquialism, but I would certainly say that this is a tried and true analogy when it comes to this piece. Um, This is the one opera that he wrote that didn't have staging, right? It's, you know, there's, (laughs) I was doing the, uh, the, the ending of it for the, uh, 
uh, the Luz Eterna, and it has that part where you go, Requiem that whole thing, right? And right in the middle of it, instinctively, I just went, because it's like the same type of tomb uh, atmosphere that, you know, this is a uh, dark, this, uh, so yeah, it just, uh, you know, Verdi wrote this opera, <laughs> this oratorio, and it's just so powerful. It has drama. It has, you know, all the things that you want in opera, all the things that you want in music, it's all there, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, powerful piece. Uh, I was watching the bass drum at the beginning of the DS era yesterday, which is one of my favorite things to watch. And I just don't like it when they're not whacking that thing to kingdom come. And he's, I mean, he's giving it all he's got. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so, you know, if you, <laughs> if you like drama, if you like excitement, if you like music, if you like uh, the human voice and seeing what they're capable of doing at every range, you know, from top to bottom, you know, uh, we have a great cast. The chorus sounds great. The orchestra sounds amazing. The conductor knows it. It's just an exciting event to be a part of, you know, and uh, I catch myself all the time mouthing the words of the chorus, even when I'm not singing. Yeah, it's got every every emotion and every everything you would ex- ex- ever expect from the opera, from the tenderness to the, the, the fear and the terror. Uh, just everything the is there. And, you know, it starts out very soft, and then you go into this Dies Irae <laughs> that just knocks the, yeah. your hair off your head. Um, and then it ends very, very softly, too. And, and, and I was thinking of it this morning. I got out my score, and I was looking at it, and I was like, you know, this reminds me of the story of Elijah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because you had the whirlwind and all yeah. the uh, yeah. drama. And, and at the end, God was in the still, small right. voice yeah. at the very end. And that kind, of, that kind of thought just came to me there because this is sacred drama. Oh in yeah, absolutely. Every aspect, and and yet at the end you bring it back to this still small voice. You know, my debut was in this exact same piece with this exact same symphony. Uh, was that 2013, 14, some of that? Yeah. So I'm happy to be back. Um, is there any particular part in it that you, particularly as a vocalist, just really love? You know. Um, It's the first oratorial piece I learned uh, while I was studying. And, uh, yeah, so what do I love? You mean the moments I am singing or the moments I'm not singing? Because there's so much, you know. um, I love the more stupid beat because it pops up right in the middle of that DS here. And I get to walk. You know, I I stand at the climax of that cutting off. And you hear, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's kind of like the Grand Inquisitors entering the room, you know. That I mean, it's that kind of spooky type feeling. Um, so I love that part, and I uh, get the end of sponsor with a high E, you know, and then the trombones. Are so, it's just great. That's like a moment. But immediately after that, the Libra script two starts, and I'm just like caught up in that moment with the mezzo, uh, the NJ Misco. I love to just sit and 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 groove in that moment. Keeping in mind that immediately afterwards, I have the Confutatis Maladiti. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can name every moment in this thing that touches me, but, you know, it's, it's always highlighted by the fact that, oh, you got to go on right after this. So you can't get caught up in what he's doing. You have to think about delivering what you have to deliver. Uh, two other points. I mentioned the, 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 the Requiem at the end, but the end of my aria, at the end of the uh, uh, Confutatis Maleditis, uh, is the reintroduction of the cataclysmic, you know, the the bass drum, the the DS area comes back. So I love that part. E- pump, pump, pump. That's just, I got chills right now because I live for that moment. Not just because I'm coming off the high E, but because it's a great moment. So, <laughs> Yeah, and, and it, it seems to me that, you know, every great opera, just like every great piece of sacred music too, um, in some way really speaks to us as human beings at a core of who we are and what we are. And, you know, this one seems to speak to so many different levels of our existence, of our being. And the ending of such, right? Yeah. yeah absolutely. And <laughs> so, the yeah. ending, yeah. which gives you in mind. Although, even with that ending, the liberame, that, that's, that's hope. It is with hope, yeah. 
and uh, I was giving the soprano a hard time yesterday because she gets to sit there and watch us all just go at it for two hours. But then the last 20 minutes, it's all on her, you know. <laughs> By the, you know, I'm, I'm wiping my brow. I put my score up and it's like, okay, entertain me now because this is going to be great. So, <laughs> you know, it's a great piece. Um, spiritually, emotionally, vocally, musically, it's just very, very refreshing to be able to come back and revisit this piece again. So I'm honored to be here. Well, we're honored to have you here. Morris Robinson, uh, thanks you for sharing your time today and your artistic gifts with us here in Tucson. Well, thank you for having me. That was AZPM's Andy Bade talking with Morris Robinson. You can catch more of Andy's interviews at azpm.org under Classical Extempore. And that's it for this episode of More Than a Game. Join us next time as Tony Maybe returns after cleaning out his locker in Iowa City and we hear about fan travel to sporting events and baseball played by its original rules. This show is produced by me, Zach Ziegler, with mixing help this week from Annalise Wiley. Our news director is Christopher Conover. Our logo is designed by A.C. Swedberg. Thanks to our marketing team for their help in launching this podcast. This show is a part of the AZPM podcast family, You can find all of our podcasts, news, and video productions at azpm.org. I'm Zach Ziegler, returning to my spot behind the scenes. We'll see you next week. AZPM podcasts are made possible in part by donations from listeners like you. Learn more at support.azpm.org. Thank you.